Good day, and today's lecture is a brief introduction to Programmable Logic Controllers, or PLCs. Our objective is to describe the main parts, purpose, and function of a PLC, and introduce some general concepts common to most PLCs. Though the scope of this lecture is introductory in nature, pay close attention to the terms employed and defined, since they will be routinely employed across a broad spectrum of later applications. If at any point in your education you wish to come back and review this core introductory material, that option is available and encouraged. As we've previously discussed, logical operations of immense complexity can be created by hardwiring input devices, relays, and output devices in a prescribed fashion. The classic example is the logical AND operator formed by the series connection of two normally open contacts. Contact 1 AND contact 2 must both close to assert the output. In contrast, the logical OR operator is formed by the parallel connection of two normally open contacts, either contact 1 or contact 2, or both of them together can close to assert the output. Traditional hardwire relay-based ladder logic, however, is progressively being replaced with reprogrammable devices known as Programmable Logic Controllers, or PLCs. A PLC is essentially a ruggedized computer designed to operate in an industrial environment characterized by wide ranges of humidity, particulate contamination and temperature, electrical noise, unclean power, and higher voltages. PLCs are designed to replace hardwired relay-based ladder logic because they are more reliable, flexible, cheaper, faster, can communicate more effectively, and perform advanced data processing functions. PLCs differ from normal computers in that they are designed to run a single program in a stepwise or sequential fashion. The reliability and flexibility of a PLC stem from the fact that they are reprogrammable devices. Programming prevents errors due to miswiring, and the devices can be reprogrammed without rewiring. This is a major time and cost savings advantage. Consider the labor involved in converting our previous hardwired AND operation into a hardwired OR operation. This would necessitate a technician physically removing one wire and adding two more. Imagine if this was just one of a hundred similar systems necessitating the same modification. Compare and contrast the ease if all 100 systems could simply be reprogrammed over a communications network at the push of a button to perform the OR function without the expensive and time-consuming requirement of physically rewiring it. In addition to these advantages, PLCs are designed to facilitate troubleshooting with diagnostic tools. Depending upon the degree of complexity, PLCs can generate reports, log faults, and technicians can simulate and run the program line by line or force inputs and outputs. Although intended to replace traditional hardwire relay-based ladder logic, PLCs are still often programmed using methods astoundingly similar to ladder logic. Here are two PLC programs executing the two-input AND and the two-input OR function using a graphical programming method called relay ladder logic. The similarities between this programming method and traditional hardwire relay-based ladder logic are obvious. Other programming methods include graphical means like function block diagrams or textual ones like structured text. Regardless of the methodology employed, the purpose of a PLC, like traditional hardwire relay-based ladder logic, is to control and coordinate a larger system by starting, stopping, and changing the direction of actuators like electric motors and hydraulic cylinders. Additionally, PLCs can modify and manage actuator output characteristics like varying the rotational speed and torque of an electric motor or the extension and retraction force and speed of a hydraulic cylinder. Finally, systems employing PLCs can perform additional functions like counting, timing, comparison, arithmetic, and data processing functions. PLCs are rated by memory and input and output capacity and format, whether they're fixed or modular and expandable, as well as the different types and number of available programming instructions. PLCs, in addition to coordinating and controlling a single process, can also be used to coordinate and control and communicate with other PLCs. A PLC is characterized by several parts, notably the CPU, inputs, outputs, a communication port, a power supply, a chassis, and a reprogramming device. The CPU is the brains or memory of the PLC and it is the portion that evaluates the state of the inputs, outputs, and other data and executes the program. 
the input is the interface between the PLC and remote or field input devices like switches or sensors. The input conditions and isolates the input signals from the internal and the output signals. The output is just the opposite. It is the interface between the PLC and field output devices like the coils of contactors or solenoid-operated hydraulic valves. The output conditions and isolates the output signals from the input and internal signals. The chassis is the housing of the PLC, which could either be modular or fixed. The power supply is the DC or AC input necessary for operation. The communication ports allow the PLC to send and receive data as well as allow other devices to monitor and control the process. Input or output could therefore be local or at the point of use of the PLC, or remote, meaning these signals come from a different place via the communication port. Delivery of remote inputs and outputs via the communication ports saves the necessity of multiple long wire runs. A PLC can be reprogrammed via manual entry, a handheld device, or a PC in a communications link. Input or output from a PLC can either be DC or AC. Common flavors of pilot level voltage include 24 volt DC and 120 volt AC with a progressive movement towards devices favoring the safer 24 volt DC requirement. Field inputs and output devices must be compatible with a PLC's operation voltage and if not, necessitate the use of interposing relays that translate one voltage flavor to the other. As the name implies, an interposing relay simply interfaces the two different voltage schemes. Input and output signals are conditioned by the input and output modules by enforcing minimum trigger levels, filtering electrical noise, and debouncing switched input. Sometimes this is done by using optical isolators, devices that link the PLC CPU to the input and output modules using light only. Output mechanisms can take the form of electromechanical relays with moving parts, or solid state devices with no moving parts like transistors or triacs depending upon the characteristics of the field output devices. Input or output from a PLC can either be digital or analog in nature. Digital signals have two mutually exclusive states, off or on, with no intermediary between states. A pressure switch would be an example of a digital input in that it sends a clear closed or a clear open signal to the PLC. A contactor coil would be an example of a digital output in that it requires a clear on or a clear off signal from the PLC. The contactor, based on the state of the PLC output, would either be open or closed and never a little bit of both. An analog signal, in contrast, is one that is continuously infinitely variant inside a given range. A pressure sensor would be an example of an analog input in that it sends a proportional electrical output based on input pressure. More pressure results in more voltage. This analog signal can be analyzed by the CPU and the PLC respond appropriately to pressure conditions inside a specific range. A variable solenoid for a hydraulic proportional valve would be an example of an analog output and that movement of the spool varies in proportion to the electrical output. More voltage output means more movement of the spool and consequently more flow. The analog nature of the output signal would allow an appropriately proportionate response for a given input condition. There are a number of different confusing schemes used to classify PLCs. However, I split them into two very large general categories. PLCs can either be fixed or modular. Small sized basic fixed PLCs are often self-contained standalone units, sometimes incorporating the power supply, input and output modules, CPU, and any communication ports into one integrated package. These devices may or may not be expandable with expansion modules. Small size basic fixed PLCs are ordinarily very inexpensive, however limited in functionality and are best suited for less complex applications. These devices are known alternatively as programmable logic relays or PLRs, intelligent relays, smart relays, logic modules, or other manufacturer specific terminology. Examples of small size basic fixed PLCs include the Tico SG2 PLR, the Easy Intelligent Relay family, Siemens Logo Logic Modules, 
and the Allen Bradley Pico or Micro programmable logic controllers. All these manufacturers offer variants within these families with different characteristics like supply voltage and number and type of inputs and outputs depending upon application. These devices can be programmed via manual entry on a ridiculously small screen or via a communications link in a PC running manufacturer specific programming software. Some manufacturers offer fully functional programming software for free. Other manufacturers may require purchase of the programming software. The fully functional programming software allows a user to create and simulate a program as well as download it to an actual device and sometimes monitor the process online. Other manufacturers offer demo and simulation programming software for free and necessitate the purchase of software to program and monitor an actual device. Later lectures will take a closer look at some of these small basic fixed PLCs in programming software. An advanced modular PLC in contrast is composed of removable modules housed inside a chassis. Sometimes the modules plug into a backplane or a rack or clip onto a DIN rail and then laterally plug into each other. A modular PLC requires a power supply and the CPU module, however the number and type of communications, input and output modules can be customized depending upon the application. Modular PLCs are therefore the most flexible devices and with this flexibility comes their inherent power and complexity. The software used to program these devices is also inherently more powerful and expansive than that used to program a small basic fixed PLC. Operations of immense complexity can be coordinated and controlled using an advanced modular PLC. Examples of advanced modular PLCs include the Allen Bradley Control Logics, Compact Logics and MicroLogix series, the Siemens S7 family, and the Automation Direct Click series. These devices are programmed using manufacturer-specific software that, again, may or may not be offered for free. Demo and simulation versions might be available with limited functionality. Though robust and accepted as the industry standard, some of these software packages are not exactly the most user-friendly and necessitate a steep learning curve. This being said, immensely powerful applications await those daring enough to venture into this thick, tangled jungle. Ordinarily, most PLC manufacturers necessitate the use of proprietary software and communication protocols to interface their specific devices. However, certain manufacturers allow the use of open software and open communication protocols. An important concept central to all PLCs is the difference between field input and output devices and programmed instructions. A field device is that physical switch or coil that really exists and really interfaces with the real world. A programmed instruction, in contrast, is the symbolic representation and result of manipulation of input and output status used by the PLC program to make decisions. The values manipulated by a PLC are logical states, symbolized by zero, low, or false, being the absence of voltage, and a one, high, or true, being the presence of voltage. A quick example of this important distinction between field devices and programmed instructions could be a single field switch that can be logically instantiated multiple times in a PLC program. Consider a four input, four output PLC with a normally open field input device on input one. However, this is logically instantiated three times using a make instruction controlling three separate outputs. The make instruction disallows logical continuity anytime the field input device sends a logical zero to input one and allows logical continuity anytime the field input device sends a logical one to input one. When the field input device is in the deactivated open state, input one experiences a logical zero being the absence of voltage. The PLC then evaluates the input and determines the logical continuity does not exist on any line and no output is energized. When the field input device is placed in the activated closed state, input one experiences a logical one being the presence of full pilot voltage. The PLC then evaluates the input and determines logical continuity does exist on all three lines in the program and all three outputs are energized. The PLC energizes the appropriate output relay coils and the associated contacts close. 
the pilot lights associated with outputs Q1 through 3 illuminate. This virtual replication, made possible by a PLC, saves technicians the time and trouble of physically wiring numerous redundant inputs or more expensive and bulky mechanically interlocked devices. As if that wasn't enough, the logical representation of input inside a PLC program can be employed radically different than that defined by a field input device's electromechanical nature. Consider a normally open field input switch on input 1, logically instantiated three times using a make instruction, and a fourth using the break instruction. The break instruction, essentially the opposite of the make instruction, allows logical continuity anytime the field input sends a logical zero to input 1 and disallows logical continuity anytime the field input device sends a logical 1 to input 1. When the field input device is in its deactivated open state, input 1 experiences the absence of voltage or a logical 0. The PLC then evaluates the input and determines logical continuity does not exist on the first three lines, however does exist on the fourth line. Thus only output 4 is energized. When the field input device is placed in the activated closed state, input 1 experiences the presence of full voltage or a logical 1. The PLC then evaluates the input and determines logical continuity does exist in the first three lines, however does not exist in the fourth line, thus only outputs 1 through 3 are energized. I'm sorry, did I just blow your mind? Take time to think about the repercussions of this mind-blowing flexibility. You can do whatever you want to do with whatever you want to do it with however many times you want to do it and you never have to physically rewire the system. Can you dig it? We'll examine this extremely powerful feature in greater detail in later lectures. And no, it's not an easy concept to understand. And no, manufacturers aren't always consistent with their definitions. This is to suggest that an introductory lecture with such a broad scope cannot possibly probe the depths of every manufacturer's specific intricacy, and only due diligence on your part can. Take the time necessary to familiarize yourself with your specific device and software, because misinterpretation on your part may have disastrous consequences. We'll take a closer look at basic PLC instructions, like the make, break, output enable function, and more in later lectures on PLC programming. In addition to the reprogrammable and field versus logical nature of PLCs, fundamental implementation differences exist between PLC programs and hardwired relay-based ladder logic. Hardwire relay-based ladder logic is implemented in real time, where real time is simultaneous or concurrent, whereas PLC programs are ordinarily implemented by the CPU using scan time. Scan time is a sequential reading of a PLC program from top to bottom and then returning to the top. This means if a CPU is currently scanning line 4 and something on line 1 changes, the CPU needs to read through the whole program before it starts at rung 1 again to notice something has changed. This can be used to your advantage to perform powerful functions ordinarily not possible with hardwire relay based ladder logic or just as easily, one can impale themselves upon this feature and bleed to death. For example, consider a critical momentary input on line 1 that disappears by the time the CPU returns to the top line. Ordinarily, the CPU executes the scan fast enough not to make this an issue. However, for critical motion control tasks using a lengthy program, this might be a deal breaker. Good efficient programming practices can compensate for these undesirable results. Finally, the programming environment of PLCs can utilize programmed elements not physically present or even possible with traditional hardwire relay-based ladder logic. Examples would be persistent and non-persistent memory coils, counters, timers, one-shots, and latching and unlatching coils. All these programmed elements are not physical devices, but rather virtual elements that can be used or not used at the discretion of the programmer and the needs of the process. Even small, basic fixed PLCs with supposedly limited functionality can do the job of a heavy, heavy box of relays that would do lasting damage if you ever dropped it on your foot. The ability of a PLC to shrink the footprint and sheer mass of the controller 
is often reason enough to upgrade from traditional hardwire relay-based ladder logic. In addition to this benefit, PLCs are more reliable, flexible, powerful, cheaper, faster, facilitate troubleshooting, and can communicate more effectively and perform advanced data processing functions. As if that wasn't enough, if you don't like what a PLC is doing, you can always change what it's doing by reprogramming it without the messy necessity of physically rewiring it. All right, that's about it for this brief introduction to PLCs. We'll examine other concepts related to PLCs and PLC programming in later lectures. In conclusion, this lecture performed a brief overview and orientation to the Programmable Logic Controller, or PLC. We discuss the purpose and basic parts of a PLC and discuss different types of PLCs. Additionally, we discuss the differences and advantages of PLC over traditional hardwired relay-based ladder logic. Remember to review this material as often as you need to really drive it home. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest. We'll see you again during the next lecture of this series.